Good evening, everybody. Welcome to Growers Live. I'm Josh Satin, and very excited to be here as always. Really special guest tonight, we have Howard Allen of Faithful Farms. If you don't know Howard and his work, uh, you're in for a treat tonight for sure. Howard is uh, someone I always enjoy talking with. And the coolest thing also is that, you know, Howard is not far from me, and I've met Howard, and I've done some filming with him, and he's super special and is a great no-till farmer great farmer, great person, and all that kind of stuff. And we'll get to we'll get Howard in here one second. Uh, just one quick announcement. I got to make a quick plug. If you don't already know about Jesse's book, it is out now. Uh, and if you are looking to pick up a copy, I highly recommend you do that through notillgrowers.com. Some of the proceeds will go back to Notill Growers and into our creative budget so that we can make more content like this and other cool stuff. So super cool. Uh, really proud of Jesse. Uh, obviously, I've been you know, hearing about this book for a few years and it is awesome. So I highly recommend you go check it out. Uh, there's a link down below if you want a direct link to it, but notillgrowers.com. You can also get it in other places. And if you are internationally, um, I would check with a local book source to do that. Uh, the shipping is very expensive, but anyways, just wanted to let you know this is out. It's happening. We're ship We've already shipped a bunch. So other than that, I don't really have any announcements. So let's get Howard in here. Howard Allen. Hey, Josh. Good to see you, man. Hey, good to see you, too. Okay, hold on one second here. All right. All right, cool. I got it all sorted out. <laughs> Always technical issues on my end. Thanks for coming on tonight, Howard. How are you? Hey, man, I'm doing pretty good. Yeah, I was hanging out here after a long day. I hear you. I hear you. It's, it's a harvest day for me. I, I don't know why I decided my harvest day is the same day I do lives. So, like, every, every time I do the lives, I'm, like, exhausted. But, you know, we're, we're here for everybody, right? <laughs> man of the rush you know yeah yeah so if you guys don't know like howard howard's farm is in chapel hill north carolina and if you're not i mean i don't know why you would know this but we're only about what 45 minutes from each other and yeah. if people don't know like the triangle is the area it's raleigh durham and chapel hill so we're near each other not exactly in the same area but pretty close and howard i have i think it was maybe about a year and a half ago that i was out of your farm uh, or so yeah. and it was maybe back in 2019 maybe in the fall somewhere around there yeah yeah, and I was blown away. I mean, I, I think I was I found out about getting in touch with you from Veer and Gordon, and they're like, yeah. you got you got to go talk to Howard. And I was like, all right, we'll go talk to Howard. And uh, it, you know, we've kept in touch, but it's you know we're all so busy. So can you tell a little bit about like your farm and and some of the things you have going on, and you know maybe talk about the operation just just generally if people aren't familiar with what you have going on. Yeah, so I say um, we are Faithful Farms, and this is a family. I mean operation um you know i'm the main farmer and my wife she just started on the farm team which we'll talk about a little bit later on but we currently farm you know um mainly on my church's land which is about a half mile from my house and we're currently farming a little over half acre uh, under um, tunnels and we're planning to expand more to another half acre probably this fall going into next year uh, we're also working with another church where we have about maybe a little under half an acre there too um, on the production, but it's kind of on, 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 on the tarps right now. And we also have stewardship of a three acre uh, Muscadine vineyard, uh, which also has a small market garden. So we have a couple of properties, you know, that we have on our management and, you know, we officially launched the farm back in 2018. Um, so we're still newbies, you know, in terms of farming and we're still learning, you know, still bumping our heads and, you know, still having fun though. Yeah. yeah. Cool. Yeah, we'll get into some of those uh, bumping heads and uh, expansion problem uh, issues and stuff a little bit later. But I know when I went to go visit you, you said you only started in 2018, so you were pretty fresh on that property. Oh yeah, I mean we were fresh. Um, it's funny. I left my job um, as an executive chef July 17th, so almost like four years to the date. I mean today, and so yeah, so we were fresh. You know, just kind of you know kind of stepping out on faith and you know just following that dream. Yeah. Cool. And that's another thing I want to talk about, the fact that you not only were a chef, but you're also a culinary instructor and you have a big yeah, background in education. And I think that's comes through a lot in how you bring people to your farm, your presence on social media and just general you know, abundance mindset of just like you help so many farmers in the area. I, I can't imagine like many people don't know about what you're up to in this area. Well, you know, I mean, I think it's about transparency and I think, you know, that you know, I believe that we're all stewards in our own right. Um, we've been given so much, and I think it's our responsibility to understand that it's not just for us things that's been given to us or 
are currently in our stewardship. So we have to share those things. And so I think it's a pleasure and an honor to be able to do so. You know, so yeah, that's been my stance, you know, is that whatever I have, it's not just for me, but for others. So if you're, you know, connected to me or you come in contact with me and I can share whatever I have, then I mean, that's what it's all about. Yeah. Agreed completely, man. All right. So let's talk a little bit. I think I, I want to talk a little bit about the farm expansion and sort of the changes, because I know like when I met you, you were like, all right, we're, we're farming on our church's land and we're trying to make this work and you're bootstrapping it pretty hard. And you were so clever with some of the infrastructure you had set up, like bootstrapping tunnels and irrigation. And you were just growing so much food there. It was just incredible. Yeah. Uh, so how has that evolved into where you guys are now and what's the plan moving forwards? So that has evolved a lot. I mean, since since the last time you were here, I mean, when you got there, we had just finished building our third hundred foot tunnel, and uh, one was the official one was like the original farmer's friends kit, you know, short plastic, all that stuff. You know, like we evolved since then, and we got two twenty by one hundreds that were basically frames without plastic, and so we took those and you know we just DIY them, put them back together, and we made them work. Um, but since then, um, we've added a um, total of five more tunnels. So we have a total of now eight tunnels, I mean, side by side. So a little over a half acre fully covered um, coming into this year. And, you know, that's been a good thing, but we also had some challenges, you know, along the way. Yeah. So I am, you know, that I am also a huge fan. I'm growing 100% under plastic and I'm like, oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Can you talk, can you talk a little bit about that decision? I mean, I, I obviously think I know, but <laughs> tell everyone about that. So the decision came from day one and really looking at other farmers, you know, and, you know, me living in Chapel Hill and literally I'm on the backside of Carborough. So going to one of the best farmers market in the area, which is a Carborough farmers market and it's the place that we happen to be a vendor at now. And so I've been going there since 2004 and just seeing farmers, talking to farmers on a weekly basis, you know, visiting the farms, you know, on the Triangle Farm Tour every year. And just seeing infrastructure and what I saw was that there are many farmers obviously were doing a great job but not a lot of people had a lot of hoop houses or tunnels and so as I somehow kind of stumbled into this farming thing which you know was not by you know design I wanted to see okay what would be the advantage going forward and seeing you know you know climate change you know these heavy rains that we get and when I started out at my home, my first thing was wanting to just grow food for my family and give them some sense of what I had growing up in the islands in Jamaica. You know, this year round, you know, food, you know, at your disposal anytime. So that's where it started. And I noticed, you know, with my DIY tunnels, you know, made out of just, you know, plastic and um, electrical conduit, you know, from, you know, your local home um, improvement store, that it really made a difference in terms of like, you know, having things earlier, having things later. Um, so it made sense that when I actually went into farming, that my goal was to get a half acre worth of covered space first. And so for many reasons, one, because I knew that that half acre point from seeing a few other farms in the area, that at that, at that size covered space, you can really have a good market garden production year round. And you can pay the bills, but from then you can use that as a, a leaping point and a point of leverage to go forward and then um, scale up, but also to, you know, go back outdoors, but now you have something that's firm, you know that, okay, I'm gonna get X amount of crops year round guaranteed in this system. And then after that, I can decide to whether I wanna build more tunnels or then increase outdoors on a larger scale, but at the same time be secure in terms of income, you know, and, um, you know, not being washed away literally, you know. Yeah, I mean, I after coming after leaving my farm and I saw all the heavy rains and all the damage that that happened. I'm like, when I came back here after last year at Raleigh Sea Farm, I'm like, I'm growing, I'm under tunnels. Like, there's no way around it. And like when oh, we yeah. got, and I just posted a video about this on my channel. But you know, like the fact that rain is probably the biggest reason that I want to have tunnels. Like, we had oh, yeah. we had Elsa come through, and like I didn't get that much damage. But I, did you guys get that storm the following day? We had a crazy thunderstorm the day after Elsa. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, we got it too, but again, you know, I mean, for us, it's like, if it rains, I mean, unless it's lightning, I mean, it's just business usual for us, <laughs> you know? 
So that's my only thing is like lightning. I don't play. I mean, if there's any thunder, I'm like gone. I'm like a scared cat. Um, but beyond that, I mean, it's just business as usual when it comes to heavy rains. So having tunnels, you know, and a system, you know, that we have today, I think has been the best move we've made um, as a farm. Yeah, I agree completely. Um, I think that if you don't live in an area where you get those sort of rainfalls, it's kind of hard to understand the damage yeah. that can happen so quickly. And as you said, it kind of gives you that guaranteed or guaranteed in the farming world, you know, like, yeah. Yeah. Okay. So as you guys are putting a half acre or you have a half acre under plastic now, what are some of the other sort of growing pains uh, and start from this like bootstrap to sort of trying to run it like more professionally and like bigger production. And can you talk a little bit on some of those things? Yeah. So I would say first thing is just, um, you know, trying to change your mindset from a bootstrap mindset to a more professional mindset. And that's been a struggle. And even up until maybe three days ago, this past Saturday or Friday, actually I had a friend call me up and say, Hey, you know, a farmer that we know, you know, he's, you know, selling, you know, he's going out of business, you know, he's selling all this stuff, you know, he's, he's retiring. And he had these tunnel frames and it was like, oh yeah, let's jump on that really quick. I'm like 400 a piece, you know, so I was like all in and it didn't work out that day. And then as I thought about it overnight, I'm like, what are you doing? It's like, like, what are you doing? <laughs> so then I saw the farmer on Friday, on Saturday and I was like, man, you know, I think I jumped into that really too fast and I don't think I'm going to be buying those houses, you know, and I explained to him, you know, the reason why, and it totally made sense. But for me, it's just. I've been so into that bootstrap mode of, you know, if you see a house on Craigslist, like get it today, think about it four months from now of how you're going to put it together. But those things don't normally come, you know, that easy. But now it's like, I don't have to do that. And then slowing down and looking at my decision, I'm like, well, by the time I spend 800 bucks on a hundred foot frame and I buy plastic, I do this, I buy that hardware, I'm pretty close to about two grand. So maybe I'll add an extra 400 bucks onto that and just call farmers friends and wait for a truck to show up with a brand new kit, you know? Yep. So, you know, so that's been, I think probably one of the biggest changes mindset and just, it's like what I call a dinosaur effect where, you know, you have a big body in terms of like the farms growing, but the mindset is still really small. And so now you have to catch up mentally, you know, so moving more into that managerial thinking of how we, operate the farm from a day-to-day -day basis and how we decide how to grow going forward. The dinosaur effect. I love it, Howard. Um, <laughs> although you don't want to be like a dinosaur and... Right, right. You know, but I mean, that's where we are temporarily right now. But I think the great thing is being able to recognize where you are, I think, you know, and be truthful about your state. Yeah. You can say, all right, well, these things are going, you know, not so well, but here are the reasons why. For example, you know, now we have eight tunnels on the production, but I was transitioning, you know, the space, you know, from three tunnels and adding five more and doing that, you know, over winter when you thought that would be the most ideal time. But then we had one of the wettest years last year going into winter on record. So now turning beds from one way to the other and really, you know, reinventing the wheel, so to speak. It just slowed everything down. So a tunnel that would take two people just dragging their feet a week to set up it took us maybe like two weeks because like dodging the rain, making beds, you know, all the things that we do in our no-till setup, you know, walkways, wood chips, you know, wheelbarrows, you know, getting stuck in mud. I mean, yeah, it's just been, yeah, it was a pain. So that took us a lot longer. Also to within that space, we had our, our seedling house. And then, of course, transition the seedling house from that spot to a new place. And then that place also had two 50-foot houses, so they had a transit. So basically, in, in a nutshell, we just really had to rebuild the whole farm. And in doing so, we just never met all of the goals, and we're still kind of coming out of that right now where we're in the last phases of putting together our new seedling house, which is a new high tunnel, you know, that's a 30 by 50. You know, and so we're doing that the right way. Um, and our, you know, I would say transition seedling house, just haven't met up, you know, to our, you know, production needs, you know, we've lost a lot of things, you know, birds are coming in eating your seeds. I mean, it's just, <laughs> well, yeah. Howard, I know that there's like, a, there's so much content out there about how to start a farm, how to start a farm cheaply. 
Yeah. But then they're like, the next step is always like, now what? Like we got the farm rolling and it, yeah. you don't want to go back and say, I should have done it a different way necessarily. Cause that was your journey, right? Like that's how it happened. Yeah. I would say, I mean, that was my journey and the process was that I learned so much um, along the journey. And I think today I've really kind of put that together because I really want to teach people, okay, here's how you can do it in a bootstrap manner and be successful. But here's also how you can do it um, in a more strategic manner. But again, it comes down to resources and what the person has. And so I think going through this process was amazing. I mean, I learned a lot and I'm looking forward to sharing that with others, you know, on both ends, you know, and, and to be able to, con to consult people where they can navigate this system and either way circumvent a lot of the headaches that we went through. Right. And so as as this sort of transitioning into this larger, more production oriented, systemized farm, like your roles change too, right? Like your crew's bigger. How's that been for you? Yeah, uh, that's really funny. Um, well, you know, I have a bigger crew, um, you know, and we focused on SOPs last year. But now it's like you're actually putting those SOPs into practical application. Like, well, you know, they need to be fine tuned. We actually need more SOPs, you know, SOPs for every little thing you know, washing trays, you know, I mean, you know, the simple things that you really never thought about or because you've been the guy who's been doing it, but now it's like, okay, if you're going to get this person and you want every other person to do this, well, there's SOP. So now there's like a list of SOPs, you know, that we have to just knock off. Um, and really I'm dedicating someone to do that because, you know, I'm still a full-time farmer. Yeah. Those are the things that you really don't think about. You yeah. know, I, I always made, I, I don't know if, if I've ever talked about this uh, in a video, but when you write an SOP as well, you have to be really specific. And like for the example I always like to use is like, if you told someone to make a peanut butter and jelly sandwich and they've literally never like done anything, it's like, take yeah. the bread out of the cabinet, put it on the counter, open the bag, take the bread, like everything has to be like laid out. So if you want people to follow it, it's gotta be like super specific. I, that is, that's hard, man. It can be. Yeah. It's honestly, it's it's the KISS method because a lot of times I find myself like, well, this person should know that they're not that stupid. And I'm like, well, it's not about being stupid. You know, like this is me talking to myself. It's right. Not about being, it's about the KISS mentality. You know, keep it simple, you know, <laughs> fill in the blank. <laughs> so that's been the process of me just, okay, keeping it simple, step by step. Yes, this person is obviously intelligent, but what if, you know, this person may, you know, have some type of shortcomings, you know, in terms of like, well, they need really simple instructions, you know, in terms of like comprehension, you know, some people, you know, may have challenges in different areas that you may not know about. And you just say, Hey, you know, one, two, three, you can do this. And they're like, well, what do you mean? You know, do you pour the peas in, you know, do you spread them? What do you mean by spread it? You, you know? So it's just, yeah. Yeah. And the judgment, a lot of stuff you do it yourself, you don't even realize you're making judgment calls all the time. Like, how big is a carrot supposed to be? How big is this bunch supposed to be? Right. You know, all that kind of stuff. I went through that a lot last year, so I, t <laughs> I totally get it. Yeah, yeah. So so it's it's been a process. So I think for me now, the transition has been stepping out of the employee role, more into the managerial role, and definitely more into the CEO role, where now it's about the vision, the bigger picture. And, you know, so now, you know, having that translation between the manager CEO and then trying not to be that employee where every time someone doesn't show up or something doesn't go right, you're stepping in and doing it. You know, it's like the old saying says that, you know, if you want to do it or if you want to get it right, go. If you don't, we'll send somebody else, you know, so. <laughs> I think it's it's um, <laughs> the, the whole idea of like working on the business and not in the yeah. business. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. 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 Um, all right, cool. Uh, and I think that's a great point you made about the tunnels too. I think I, people ask me all the time and I, my channel has been sponsored by farmer's friend and this show has also, but that's not why I say this and it doesn't have to be farmer's friend, but man, when you order the kit and it just shows up, like how much is your time worth? You know? Yeah. I, I think that that gets overlooked a lot when you're bootstrapping and you're like, but I saved like $50. I'm like, yeah, you spent 20 extra hours. Like, and might have an inferior situation as well once it's set up. And that's been my mentality lately is that I would rather spend 20 hours thinking about a task that will take me an hour at the end versus, you know, an hour thinking and 20 hours worth of work. 
Yeah, so definitely I'm looking at it now. It's like, well, even now in my next transition is like, do I really want to have more Farmer's Friends kits or do I really want to step up to maybe something like what, you know, Never Sinks, you know, is using, you know, like, a, you know, a 150 foot by 30, 40 foot wide house with all the bells and whistles. So that's where my thinking is now is that, okay, you know, what's the next step? And, you know, this has worked, but is can this work, you know, as going to, you know, say an acre, you know, and rolling up, you know, you know, versus eight houses. Now you're rolling up 16 sides and all different things that come with that, you know, or maybe I spend three times the amount of money, but now everything can be controlled by my phone. You know? So how are you feeling about that? Do you think you want to go to bigger houses or you're not sure yet? Oh, definitely. Oh, yeah. We're going there. Okay. Yeah. All right. Cool. Not bad enough that I went. Yeah. All right. All right. Uh, let's switch gear. Let's switch gears a little bit here, Howard. Um, I want to talk a little about farming education because I know as a, as an educator, I, w- I wasn't going to say former educator. You still are an educator. I think you always will be. Um, can you talk a little bit about that as part of what you do? I know lately I've just been seeing a lot of your growing school, like these shorter videos on Instagram. And can you talk a little about the, the farm education side of what you do? Yeah. So I think, um, so first I'm going to say that I'm a person that I try to live as best as possible a spirit led life so wherever that spirit takes me you know that's where i seem to channel my energy and, and my focus and so that calling of late has been more into the educational space and you know whether it's just some you know just people who follow us want to know how to grow in their backyard at their home on their homestead you know how to do what we do but on a much smaller scale uh, but also to those who are interested in transition and maybe from a corporate setting or a different setting into the farm world and just want, you know, more information. And, and also too, you know, I think people also too, I think want to see people who look like them, you know, so it's just been a lot of call from, you know, that demographic. So that's been my focus of late is to try to put out content and just kind of see just, you know, where the feedback takes me and it's kind of where the spirit leads. And how's the feedback been so far? Are people like finding it and following along? Yeah, I think the feedback, I mean, has been amazing. Um, and people, you know, have been following, people have been asking for more, you know, people are making suggestions in terms of, you know, what they want to see. So, yeah, so we're going to try to do this every week and just try to put out more content. I mean, it's not going to be professional grade, you know, like what you do, but, you know, we'll get there at some point, you know. Of course, I'm definitely going to be tapping on you, you know, to get some, you know, some knowledge in terms of like cameras and angles and all the cool things that you do. Um, but oh. again, I can't wait, Howard. <laughs> I can't wait. Let's do it. Well, for me, again, what I realize is that I have so much information, so much knowledge, so much ideas. So I'm always looking to create opportunities for others. So I'm like, I don't want to be the guy that's sitting at home for three, four hours editing a video. I get no pleasure out of that. So it's like, okay, how can we have the revenues where I can pay somebody who can be maybe the social media slash media you know, person for the farm, you know, and even it might squeeze us now in the beginning, but going forward as we grow as a farm, we'll be easy and easily be able to compensate this person really well. And they can also grow, you know, along with us as we grow, you know, in terms of content creation. So that's how I'm, I'm approaching this. We'll, we'll start out with our phone cameras, but eventually, you know, the right person will come along and then we'll pay them, you know, what they desire. So they can do the things that I don't like doing and they love to do. That's awesome. Yeah. I mean, Howard, I started my channel with my phone. Just saying. Yeah. Yeah. Right. <laughs> Just saying, man, you, you don't need much nowadays. The phones are pretty good. Yeah. 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 I but mean, if- the phones are, you know, for me, again, it's just at every step is like, well, I could do that, but that's an opportunity for someone else. Right. So I'm always about create, um, creating opportunities at any level, you know, because it just, I think the more capacity we can create. I think the more blessings and opportunities can come our way because it's not just about me. It's way bigger than me. You know, I'm just one tiny piece of this puzzle. So I never want to, you know, forget that. And at every step it's like, well, I could do that, but who else really enjoys that and could do that and could also benefit from what we have going on, you know? Yeah, that's, that's beautiful, Howard. And I think also people, it's good to realize what you like doing or what you're good at doing and then say, I don't like editing. I don't want to learn it. I don't want to spend the time on it. So I'm going to get someone else to do it who actually enjoys that. And I can focus on 
being Howard, running the farm, teaching people. That that's awesome, man. I love it. Can you can we talk a little bit about like uh, sort of where farming is, where it's going? Like your thoughts on that? Maybe different farming models. I know, like for ex I, I, you can talk up whatever you wanted, but I know, like when I met you and you were talking about you know farming on church land was totally a different concept to me. And um, I know other farms that do that as well, but I don't know if you want to talk a little bit about those kinds of things. That'd be cool. Yeah, I would say, I mean, farming for the future is going to be um, going back to what we had maybe 100 years ago and beyond. And it's going away from the conventional model that has been taught in the past, you know, 50, 70 years or so forth. And the, the big mega farms, I think they'll always have a place in our society. But I think we're going to scale back down to like the 5 to 20 acre farm as like a standard farm, you know, the farms that got wiped out, you know, between, I would say the fifties, you know, to the early two thousands. And I think there's going to be a resurgence of those farms coming back. Um, especially as we go through the next 20 years of just massive amount of, la of land transfer. You know, my hope is that a lot of those giant parcels will get broken up. Um, or if not at the very least have more cooperative farming models you know, on large acreage, you know, where we're doing, you know, um, different types of farming, for example, you know, produce farming, you know, agriculture, you know, um, in terms of um, produce, you know, you know, beekeeping, you know, there's all the different types of farming, but sync together um, in a farm web that makes sense, you know, versus just everyone kind of out here doing their thing to say, hey, I have a farm, look at me. But how do we come together to redesign the food web simultaneously versus trying to fix the old system, you know, or improve on it, you know, or try to dismantle it? It's like, don't even put our energy into that. But how do we reimagine something new that feeds us at this time that's a sustainable model on all levels where all the shares, where all the stakeholders, you know, from seed producer all the way to the consumer has fair stake you know, and our, you know, profit and equitably from the system. Yeah. And now that you see the way you explain it too, and I've always been intrigued by, um, you know, cooperative farming and we have, Notal Gores has a cooperative farming podcast that people don't know uh, that, ja that Jackson's doing. But when you say it that way, it's kind of like traditionally like a family farm that does a little bit of animal production, a little bit of veggies, a little bit of bees, like, but now it's like a bigger family. You just produce more food, like, you're still yeah. doing that, just it's expanded. Right, and whether it's on the same property or in the same locale, but you know, maybe on a county level, you know, um, but I think it's important that we all farm collectively because I think when we're isolated on our own, we miss the mark on so many things. We miss the opportunities, we miss the education, we miss, you know, the opportunity to you know, take advantage of what we can do in numbers versus individually. So, for example, you know, if you're a farmer and you're in an area and, you know, you know, you're kicking ass and let's say with like lettuces, but you're the guy that kind of has a secret sauce to this and you're doing all these different things. Well, you know, you maybe only have maybe 1% of the market at best. So if you can share that with others and now grow cooperatively versus competitively, you actually will gain because now as a cooperative, you can now take a bigger share of the local market share. So right. now the more dollars are circulating locally, you're now communicating together. So versus me going to the local co-op by myself and say, hey, I can grow the best lettuce and they'll work with me. If it's five of us, then now it's like, OK, this year I'm going to be focusing heavily on lettuce. Next year you'll be focusing heavily on celery and root veggies and so forth. So now we can even do crop rotation as a, as farms you know, and be able to, you know, meet the demand. But now it's not only about this customer. Now we can go knock on the door of two other customers and say, hey, you know, we have the capacity to serve and we've been doing this so far here. And now we're just expanding, growing our capacity. And we're slowly, you know, grabbing the market share because, you know, local is where it's at and it's where it's going to be going forward. So I think we want to capture that, you know, and it's easy to take, I, I think, the market share from the bigger guys we're all the way in California. We're shipping water to, especially to the East Coast. It's like, let's just figure out what they're doing there here. And then we can easily cut away from that. Yeah. 
I love it, Howard. I, there's so much to unpack there. I think part of the thing is it's cost. I think people in the United States like don't spend a lot of money on food, and that's just part of the culture. And I think that's hard for a lot of people. I mean, that's true, but I think also too that model is also changing slowly in terms of the mindset. Agreed. And I think where the education comes in is that farmers have to be more than just farmers. We have to be more than people who produce food. And so again, I think a lot of us are doers and we have to build our farms to where we're not just the doers, but we're the managers and the CEOs who can see beyond the farm, see how um, agritourism plays a big part, see how working with early childhood care and partnering with you know ch- um, you know child care centers you know you know daycare centers you know where kids can see the farmer be tangible with the farmer supply them with the food or the people who are supplying them with the food we can be the aggregators you know to those people and then make that connection and literally grow the next generation of consumers you know who are more educated and are more likely to pay you know that top dollar for food and I think last year was a great um, awakening to a lot of people when they went to the stores and the shelves were empty because the food from California wasn't there, but they can get food from Howard and, or maybe not, maybe you were sold out. <laughs> yeah, everyone had a crazy year last year. Yeah, but also, you know, I think it's just important that we have to look at the bigger picture. And oftentimes we're so busy with our head down doing what, what we love to do, but we have to look at what's long term. What does it look like, you know, 25, 50 years beyond our lifetime and what seeds are necessary to be sown today that we may not see that oak, but understand that we have to sow those seeds now and think about the other farmers who are going to be in our place 25 years from now. You know, I'm 43, you know, in 22 years, you know, I'll be the average age of, you know, you know, of a farmer today. So what do things look like 25 years from now? And so if I can set up a system today that can better the local food web and it may mean some sacrifice on my part, I think that's necessary. But if we all step in and do those small steps, I think, you know, I mean, 25 years from now, it's a totally different food system that's serving everyone. And I mean, the money is there, you know, so I think if we can sell wholesale for a certain price, then we already have a competitive advantage. Because the one thing that the bigger guys can't compete on is, you know, shelf life, you know, quality, and also, you know, the tangible part and the relationships, you know, food traceability, you know, food integrity. I mean, the big guys just can't compete with that. And so those are our strong areas which we have to take advantage of, you know, um, going forward. Agreed 100%, Howard. And I think there, I've, I mean, I know you've seen this too, but you know, things like when we had that gas shortage, uh, like two months ago and I was delivering to my restaurants and they were like, I don't know if U S foods is showing up today, but I know you're here, you know, like that sort of like, they know they can get their food that way. So, and I think, as you said, like at, if more cooperative situations happen, you have more selling power and also the people producing the food are more specialized. And so you'll have higher production. Also, too, um, speaking of, you know, like U.S. Foods and the big companies, I was talking to a guy from Cisco. I won't say his name or what he does, but they see the writing on the wall and they are going more local. There's a time they wouldn't buy from a small guy, but now they have special divisions of how do we get more local things because they know where it's at and they understand that the consumer is getting more educated and they want to see more local items. So they are already tapping into it. And they have the resources, they have the logistics. So we just can't play around and say, okay, well, you know, we got this little farmer's market thing going on. Like they're going to eat our lunch one, one way or another, you know? So it's like, let's get in there and let's get lunch, you know? So, yeah. Yeah. well, well, you have to keep in mind also well, that this sort of shift is in all different stages all across the country and the world. And you live in Chapel Hill, which is a lot more progressive in local food than <laughs> probably most elsewhere. Right. But I still think um, if we look at what it costs to produce foods, you know, um, let's say I'm in a rural county like Bladen County, which is like uh, west of Fayetteville, like small rural town. Yeah, I'm not going to be able to sell a pint of tomatoes there like a car for four dollars a pint. However, in that marketplace, I basically have the whole market to myself. 
So it's up to me now to come in maybe at two, three dollars a pint, you know, at a wholesale price, and I'm still gonna make money because eventually I can grow that market. And if I'm looking long term, it's like, well, I can capture this market, then I have, you know, maybe, you know, the surrounding markets and so forth. But over time I think we have to look long term. You know, so maybe I sell to the local market at you know, at wholesale prices and then have another market maybe aggregated that's maybe say 20 miles away that I also sell wholesale, but I think it's doable, you know, so my retail in a rural sense, maybe wholesale prices, mm -hmm. you know, and you're still being profitable because, you know, again, long term, you can build your customer base and then the rest you can sell, you know, in large bulk wholesale. So I think it's how much we're willing to put into it short term to see the long term gain. That's that's cool. And I think also once people start eating that food, they're kind of like they're they're on board. Like they taste your tomatoes and they're like, exactly. Dude, I can't buy this at the store. Like, why am I eating that other crap? Right. And again, the educational part, you know, the agritourism is like bring people into your farm, you know, you know, ice cream socials, you know, like really get people to see what it is. You know, people who are, are in these areas are isolated. You know, they still think farming, you know, is a certain way, but coming into a farm and seeing things, it's just a whole cultural shift in mindset and getting the kids involved. You know, so you may start out at this point now, but 25 years from now when I'm ready to pass the mantle, it's a whole different system. So for me, I tell people, if we're not willing to think at least 200 years beyond our current time, it's just like, just have fun at what you're doing. But it takes a long time. You know, and you have to really slow that ship down, you know, to really, even, you know, get it, you know, to change directions. And oftentimes it won't be in your lifetime. So we really have to accept that, you know, that we may see the promised land, but we more oftentimes get there. And it's really hard, Howard, as a as a human to see past like a generation or two. It's just it's very hard in our brains, I think, for a lot of yeah. us to, to to accept that. But you got to try, man. I mean, we got to try to make the world a better place. So um what, let me just say one thing is if you guys have questions, make sure you guys get them in the chat. I want to have a couple more questions for Howard, but um, we could probably chat about whatever for I'll let Howard take a take a breather there. And uh... Oh, yeah. <laughs> uh, but yeah, get some questions in Howard along those lines about getting the kids involved and stuff like he talk a little bit about the importance of family farming and and maybe a little bit about your homestead, too, and how that how that what's up with that. I remember you were just getting going on that um, last time I talked to you about it, but. Yeah, so my homestead has been in rest probably since 2016, so about four years, almost five years. And so this year, I think, was a year kind of like everything coming together again, you know, that spirit kind of saying, okay, it's time to restart things. And the genesis of that was with my wife leaving her corporate job, you know, as a head lab technologist for LabCorp. And, you know, wanted to just do something better, you know, with her degree in biology. And she's always, you know been a person who's always you know wanted to heal you know with herbs you know with essential oils and just you know a natural way you know of healing the body um you know versus you know you know pharmaceuticals and so she made a transition at the end of may and so you know it's been an awesome ride um you know so you know so since then um, we revamped the entire backyard um we have two 50 foot by 20 foot houses there um that you know we're planted in we have Tons of, you know, like 50 foot beds and some smaller 25 um, foot beds. So we're doing, you know, veggies. Uh, we have like a nice herb garden. We're doing medicinals, um, you know, perennial flowers. You know, we have, um, you know, a, I guess, um, pollinator garden. We have actually about two or three of those. You know, we have a bunch of fruit trees, you know, some, you know, some big figs that are well established, you know, from, you know, when the garden was originally established. So this has been a great year in terms of that part of our. I would say family and business just to see how the family comes together, you know, you know, with now, you know, my son who's 10, my daughter who's 14 and seeing everyone out in the backyard kind of doing their part, you know, fighting mosquitoes, you know, <laughs> um, yeah, it's, it's just been, it's just been an awesome journey and to watch my wife has a, have her first harvest and, you know, she's really an example of some of my audience members who never actually put hand to the soil, you know, despite living in a rural area and just watching her kind of go through that amazement, you know, of harvesting her first bean, you know, seeing, you know, the first tissue from the corn, you know, I'm picking her first squash and zucchinis, 
you know, not checking the zucchinis and coming back and having one, you know, the size of your forearm. <laughs> so, yeah, just all those things, I think, have been just a really beautiful transition and, you know, just for our family in a whole. And I think that's part of the wealth that you really can't put in dollars. And it's just, you know, wealth beyond, you know, just the financial capital that, that we always try to measure things by. You know, just our health, our family as a whole, you know, we're together almost every day in some capacity. You know, we're not reporting to a corporate job or any kind of job outside of the household. And it just speaks volumes in terms of just our ability just to have control of our lives. And there is no price tag on that. Uh, for me, again, you know, I think my best decision when I left my job four years ago and watching how that has transitioned on so many levels, you know, where it's just enriching our family, it's enriching all the families who are connected to us. Um, you know, and it's just the whole idea of stepping out on faith, you know, and walking by faith and not by sight and just seeing that richness, you know, within my family. I mean, it's just priceless, man. And it's just, I can't have enough words to express it, you know. So are the kids are pretty involved? Oh, yeah. I mean, you know, they're involved and I mean, you know, here at the farm, you know, where it's like picking tomatoes, they're sowing seeds. You know, my daughter, she's taking over the microgreens process. You know, my son, you know, he just kind of fills in wherever it's like, dude, you're cleaning, you're taking out trash, you know, you're, you know, you're washing bins, you're spraying trays off, you know, you know, you're, you know, you're bagging things, you're scaling things, you know, on harvest days for market. You know, my 10 year old, he loves to run the stand. So that's been one of the coolest things at market. And he's been doing this since he was seven. And last year, you know, he took a hiatus for um, um, COVID. This year he's back. So now on the days when he decides to show up at market. You know, I can just grab a latte and go hang around the markets, you know, while he runs the whole start, you know, the whole, you know, um, stand by himself, you know, no calculator. You know, he has the phone that he uses for square and, you know, he's a great conversational guy. You know, he's great with numbers. You know, the people love him. You know, he has, you know, what he calls a kid effect. <laughs> you know? uh, so it's just awesome to see them. You know, my daughter, sometimes she she'll do it, but she's not really a people's you know, person. So, you know, she'll do it, but, you know, my son, he's just like all over it, you know, and, you know, it's just, it's, it's just amazing to see everyone growing in their own capacity. You know, he's the guy that's going to be, you know, CEO of several businesses in the next 10 years, you know, and he's only 10 right now, but he doesn't want to work for anyone. You know, he's like, you know, I'm my own boss, you know, and, you know, he's growing melons, you know, for markets. He's like, yeah, I work for you, dad, um, you know, on a volunteer basis, but I don't want a paycheck. So he's already has that mindset of, you know, not wanting to work for a paycheck. So, you know, I'm looking at this as the next generation is really being formed and future generations in terms of those cornerstones are being set right now. So it's just, you know, I can't imagine you no know, next year and the years to come just how this plays out. That's awesome. Sounds like uh, your son's just a mini version of you. Every Everything you were describing about him, I'm like, that sounds like Howard, actually. Yeah, I mean, like literally, you know, when he decides to come to market or, you know, he has a market bunch of friends that he grew up with that market, literally. And I mean, this year he was like, well, these guys are playing like a little too much right now. And I'm the oldest one out of the bunch. So I'm just going to hang out right here and work the stand. Dad, just get away, get out of here. Talk with somebody. Literally, like he's like, I don't want you around. Leave. You know, so you might catch me in market sometimes sitting in an easy chair on the other side of the market, you know, with a latte, literally hanging out, you know, with one of the older farmers, just, you know, shooting the breeze. And, you know, he's just doing his own thing, you know, restocking, selling, all by himself, you know. Incredible, man. Yeah, so, I mean, so that's, I mean, just, I mean, just amazing. I mean, yeah. Must be proud. That's that's awesome. All right, let's get to some questions here. We've been chatting forever here, so let's get to some questions. Okay. If you guys have questions, please get them in. Uh, first one here is from uh, my man, Gene. Uh, how are you cooling your produce at each location before it's moved to your wash pack house? Or maybe if you could talk a little bit about the logistics with multiple locations and wash pack and, and that sort of stuff. So, so right now with multiple locations, actually, as I said earlier, I actually have all the other locations just on standby. And I decided this year not to actually farm on them because of just so much chaos at our main location. It's like trying to add those, you know, things online and then the logistics, it's just going to be just more added chaos. So it's like, so most of those locations right now, with the exception of the farmstead, they're all composted, um, tarped, you know, with silage tarps and like ready to go. 
So we're shooting for fall. And so we just had to kind of slow things down, you know, um, and just take a step back. And at the right time, we can just literally uncover, add, add, you know, transplants or, you know, run, you know, the transplanters across there and sow seeds and we're off to the races. So we've actually taken a step back on, on our production, which has made it a lot easier for us just to focus on the main production space and getting everything sorted out here first before we then start to bring in things because, yeah, yeah. Okay. Um, this can you see the comments on the screen? Um, yeah, they're kind of small. All right, I can read. I'll read them anyways. Uh, speaking oh, yeah. to, speaking to most conventional farmers, how do you reduce costs in regards to buying fertilizer and disease and pest control? Ooh, okay, that's a loaded one. So, um, first I would say with fertilizers, um, we've actually cut back on using a, a lot of compost this year. Um, the first few years we went heavy on compost, and right now, um, and actually we went into a phase a few months ago where we didn't have any compost from our local source and it was actually kind of a good thing for us it was like well we were focusing on getting to a place to wean ourselves off compost so this was like a hard wean it was like well you know we have the fertility in the ground and we do use you know some you know um armory certified amendments so it was just more of just a transition and just adding light amendments and just growing crops and i mean we've been doing great so far um What's the other part? Um, uh, pest controls, disease. So diseases, we haven't had many issues with diseases. I mean, we do a rigorous um, crop rotation on our beds. Um, pest control this year, man, we had some new pests show up. We had this black beetle, which I'm still trying to get some word back from the extension of what exactly this pest is. But it really attacked our um, hecari turnips, like small black beetle with like a brown kind of stripe down the wings and they reproduce really fast. They took out about maybe 400 feet of hackeras like back to back. And they also attacked our brassicas. So it took out like a bunch of like our um, greens mix and also um, a couple of feet, um, 100 feet of um, arugula. So we immediately just stopped growing those crops, you know, and just decided to move them to the homestead on a smaller scale and just allow um, those bugs just kind of go through their cycle. And we realized that they were, they had like a really high breeding cycle. And so for me, I like to observe things, you know, versus trying to bring in pesticides and see what work or what doesn't work. And to see, okay, maybe we just need to switch, loc you know, locales and see what happens, switch crops. And so we've done that. And so they're pretty much out of the system right now, as we can see. And then maybe next year we'll maybe bring back those items into this location and test them out. Um, but beyond that, we only use BT and we use BT pretty much on our peppers once a week and our tomatoes right after we harvest, we'll come through and do BT about once a week just for peace of mind for my hornworms and all of the other um, small um, worms I like to you know eat into your um, tomatoes. Yeah. Okay, yeah, I think, uh... I think when I was there, <laughs> I was asking about like bed prep and stuff. You were like, yeah, I just put down compost, man. Back to your like, keep it simple. Like it's, but yeah. And I know you, you uh, reached out to me. I don't know. It was like a couple months ago. You're like, where do you get compost from? I'm like, man, it's the same place you get compost from. <laughs> yeah. And with that question, because I was helping a friend in Apex to set up, you know, um, a tunnel and a similar no-till system. And it was like, well, let me see. You know, I mean, Josh is down the road and much closer. So let me see if there's a source in Raleigh. You know, versus me getting from, you know, there. But we ended up finding a source. Um, and so it actually helped me to kind of broaden, you know, my my scope as to who else has compost in this area. And, and that's also good compost. But at the end of the day, we're going to switch over to a system that incorporates more rabbits, you know, and more vermicompost, you know, and using rabbits into our system going forward. And I would say probably eliminate our compost use maybe down to maybe 10% of what we started out with. Well, you have so much in the ground already, I'm sure, you know, uh, yeah. yeah, I know. It's, yeah, yeah. And so now, I mean, we have the soil till, the wheat pressure is down maybe like 95%. So now it's a matter of just maintaining soil fertility. And I think rabbits and vermicompost is where it's at in terms of having um, a compost that can be readily made on farm, you know, in, in a controlled environment. And also using, you know, farm, you know, um, waste stream. So what's the story with the rabbits? How does that system work or how is it going to work? 
So the rabbit system for us, um, we're going to, you know, set up a rabbit hutch system, you know, like a traditional, you know, um, hutch system. And I'm going to start out with maybe probably four rabbits in the beginning. And then we'll have bins underneath, like rolling bins underneath to catch the manure and the urine. And so in addition to our uh, microgreen um, system, we'll take, you know, those trays. We'll also dump into the bins and we'll have um, composting worms in these bins. Once these bins are filled, you know, we'll, you know, allow the worms to do their thing. And then we'll fish the worms out at the end, you know, with a burlap sack and some fresh, you know, um, compost. Once they come through, we'll fish them out. But of course, you know, you probably get maybe 70% of the worms and we'll have a lot of leftovers, but a ton of like um, worm eggs will be left back. And, you know, a beautiful, um, you know, rabbit manure that's enriched with rubber compost. And also all the leftovers, you know, from your microgreen trays and like your peas and especially sunflower shoots. Now you have all those sunflower holes. Um, summertime, we have a lot of um, soldier flies, which will lay their eggs in there. And, you know, you know, the larvae is going to, you know, poop and just drop a lot more compost. So this is what we're going to use to put back in our beds now. So it'll be our own compost, but it's going to be a really rich compost. Then we'll get into compost teas. And then use the compost teas now to inject into our system, you know, using our um, drip irrigation system to inject that into our system. So really focus on a system really localized within the farm. Um, ideally, I've tried to work with a local person who has about 40 rabbits, but I'm trying to work with them to get their system to where they can capture that manure in a way where, you know, they're not having weeds and, you know, you know they also feed their rabbits hay which has seeds in it and, you know, I'm not sure about the sources. So if I can get a source that's ethical and I understand like what's going into the rabbit's diets all the way out, you know, the back end, then I'm, com you know, I'm comfortable with putting that in my farm. Again, if I can outsource this to someone who loves to grow rabbits, you know, I would definitely do that. But I definitely want to have that system here where it's also an educational piece, um, which is something I want to talk about more as we transition this particular farm um, locale. That's awesome. I think that there's a lot of people, including myself, who when you start these no-till systems, there's such a big infusion of compost to just get the thing started. But then you don't really need that much. And, you know, I've noticed even during the course of this year, I was adding, you know, a little bit on every bed flip. And I'm like, man, there's so much compost on the ground. Like I, I need some, maybe some little bit of fertility on every flip, but not not the, yeah. the big infusion. I think there needs to be more systems like you're talking about where it's more in-house, more regenerative, you know, like yeah. using more things that are really easy to get and and develop yourself. I know Jesse's working on a ton him, like right now. So I'm, I'm interested to see like what people like you guys are up to with that those sorts of things. Oh, yeah. You know, you know for example, you know, with us um, doing, you know, like microgreens, I mean, you know, we do maybe like 30 trays a week right now and we're on the low scale and we're going to scale up in the future. So how do we take, you know, the excess from that incorporate it into the farm, you know, and recycle those things, you know, we have, you know, tons of things that we're cropping out, you know, things that may go bad. And so having, you know, rabbits up, which, you know, I mean, they'll just devour that and it's instant manure, you know, there's no salmonella, you know, there's no E. coli, yeah, so I think those things are all win-wins, you know, and, you know, they don't take much, you know, to, you know, to care for. So I think how do we create, you know, closed loop systems, whether it's on the farm or working with local farms, you know, to do so. Cool. Uh, all right. So we got a question here um, from Celtic or Celtic Roots Farm. Um, this is our first year doing farmer's marketing. We're still learning how to organize our growth schedule. Any tips? I guess there's a couple questions. I guess it's about, yeah, crop planning is really the question there. Yeah, I mean, crop planning is something that's, it's 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 tough. Um, you know, I mean, for me, I would say we're still in the beginning phases of trying to figure that out. I would say grow a lot more than you need in terms of seedling. Grow a lot more than, than you think you're going to sell. Um, at the very least, you, you can give it to your neighbors, make friends, you know, give it to a local nonprofit, food bank. Um but also to just look at the whole year and try to break it down into maybe quarters. Like I think that's what we've done in the past few years. And, you know, you have your winter season, your spring, your summer. Then from there, kind of look at your transition points. You know, um, I know oftentimes most people struggle with the transition out of winter into spring and also with the transition out of summer going into fall. And I think that can, 
create a lot of problems in terms of like consistent offering at a farmer's market where it's like, well, you know, you know, when do I pull out the tomatoes when, you know, so I have a lot of flowers up here and, you know, a few fruit hanging down here. Um, so forth. Um, yeah. And so I think it's just over time, I think we'll all get it and we can all stand to get better at, you know, crop planning. I think any farmer, whether they've been in the game for three years like ourselves or 20 years, you know, you know, I mean, talk to JM, you know, and he'll say, yeah, I'm still working on, you know, <laughs> crop rotation, you know, and that succession planting and having things consistent, you know, for your offerings. And I think, you know, always looking back and taking notes, you know, taking notes of week by week, you know, what the weather was, you know, what farmer's market was like. So for me, after a farmer's market, I like to take notes on, you know, what the week was before, you know, how was the market this week, um, you know, customer turnout, customer feedback, um, how, you know, how was the farm that week, you, you know, and so in hindsight, as you're looking back, you know, let's say the following year, you can look back to that week and have a general sense, you know, or that month and have a general sense of, okay, this is what was happening this time of year, you know, Mother's Day, you know, leading up was like the height, right after Mother's Day, you know, sales fell off a cliff, but then things kind of inclined, and then maybe going into Labor Day, things were on the height, but then things fell off right after Labor Day, because of course the kids went back to school, you know, moms are trying to, you know, you know, switch from, you know, summer mode to, you know, to, you know, back to school mode, you know, and then things kind of pick up all the way to, you know, to Christmas, Thanksgiving, and then again, you know, so there are cycles, I think, throughout the whole year for farmers markets. And once you start to see those cycles, I think after a year or two, you'll get a, a better rhythm. But still, it's something that you're always fine tuning. And especially as your farm grows, then, yeah, you're constantly, you know, evolving. Man, yeah, this could be a whole hour long discussion about crop planning. And I am not the best at it. What I do is I plan my transplants. And then whenever I have open beds, I direct seed with something. So. Yeah. That's kind of how I roll. But I think another part of this is I want to talk a little bit about what choosing crops and maybe like farmer's markets. Like for me this year, it's been hard because I'm selling 100% to restaurants. And so as the restaurants just opened up in the last few months, now I'm figuring out what everyone who wants. And now yeah. I'm playing catch up this whole summer. But what about in terms of farmer's market? Like how do you decide what to bring to market? Like is it based on what everyone else is bringing? You know, how does that work for you? So I think it's based on what everyone is bringing and decide what to bring um, based on what they're bringing, maybe bring something different. Um, sometimes it could be quantity. Sometimes it could be the size. So I'm all about sales and it's something that I'm in a whole nother life um, in terms of sometimes it's not what you bring is how you bring it. So sometimes packaging, I mean, marketing, I think is a big part of it. Um, just little things where everyone may bring a standard, you know, I don't know, you know, market more cucumber that everyone knows, you know, maybe you'll get a variety, maybe like a piccolino from Johnny's. That's like a small, almost seedless variety. And maybe you harvest that, you know, at a small, maybe six inch size, but maybe you put like a half a dozen in the bag and that's totally different. You know, for me, I'm growing a variety called quirk, which is like a small greenhouse variety. You know, it's kind of sweet, kind of crunchy. You can do pretty much any and everything with it. No one else is growing that. So it's a conversation piece, you know, also knowing your market, you know, and most of my shoppers, you know, happen to be women, you know, between the age of, I would say, 22 to maybe 55, you know, and knowing that, okay, women are my biggest customers. So women like things that are cute, that are interesting, conversation piece. If you can educate them on it, they're willing to try something. If they'll like it, they'll come back. Um... So engaging the customer and finding, you know, what they like, say, hey, you know, is there something that you would like, but no one here at market has it or so forth? Customers are always quick to give you feedback. And so I like to go, you know, based on customer feedback, um, having those conversations. If people are kind of skeptical, always be willing to give them something. Say, here's something, you know, try it. You know, here's one or two ways to prepare this. Let's have a conversation about it next week. You know, let, and let me know what you think. Yeah, marketing is huge, and I think just the the relationships with customers that you make at the market. And uh, yeah. if if people are watching, haven't seen, I did a video with Jesse. I went to market with him and filmed the whole day on my channel, and he gave a lot of pointers about that kind of stuff. And I guess also, Howard, you just got to bring your your mini me, right? Is that the? 
Oh yeah, I mean, if you have a cute kid, I mean, cute kids sell veggies. Um, but also too, for me, I have a disadvantage. I mean, a advantage of being a chef and understanding food. I understand marketing. So like packaging, you know, like I focus heavily on how I pack my bag. So it's like, you know, I went from like, you know, like a wider bag to a narrow, you know, much longer bag. And, you know, for example, when my daughter's packing the bags and she was like, just like putting, you know, like lettuce, I'm like, ah, we're not going to do it this way. We're going to gently put the lettuce in because we don't want to stuff it in. And I'm like, no, look at this bag. It looks kind of wide and kind of look floppy. Look at this bag long. Make sure we put air in it so it doesn't squish as it goes to market or when the customer gets it. When a customer sees a long bag of lettuce, like, wow, you know, that that's look like it looks appealing. It looks good. The, the customer can see the value, but also to the time and effort that went into it to make sure that there is air into it. It's not it's not going to get crushed to market. It's not going to get crushed when they put it in their bag, along with everything else. So when it gets home, it's going to be fresh. Uh, make sure that your lettuce is dry, you know, long shelf life. So your customer's gonna be like, man, you know, your veggies just last so long. That that's probably our biggest feedback. It's like, man, I went on vacation. I thought I was gonna throw everything out. It was in my refrigerator for like two weeks, and it looks just like I just bought it. Man, what are you doing at your farm? You know, so those are you know the the back end things, making sure that you know we spin those things dry, how we put it, all those things matter. You know, um, how we you know set things up at the market. You know, your tablecloth your signs, you know, how you present things, all those things are what, I mean, sell your veggies, you know, but then they also have to taste good, you know? <laughs> absolutely, man. Absolutely. All right. Um, next question is, uh, how many types of greens do you grow? Um, I would say um, overall varieties, maybe about 20 right now. Um, and right now we're, probably go into market with maybe 10 to 12 different items so we grow like a standard like salad mix we went away from salad over for so many reasons and just went to a standard salad mix we have um, um head lettuces we grow two varieties year round like standard but then during the colder months we may add maybe three other varieties so for example standard would be like a mirror and a cherokee you know like clockwork 365 but then from, say, fall to, say, late spring, you know, we have a few, like, oak leaf head varieties. We add in um, one of the Salanovas. Um, I can't remember which one off the top of my head right now. And we also do um, a, a romaine. And then my other favorite, which is, oh, my gosh, the really small, dense head. I can't think of right now. Um, um, Little Gem, mm -hmm. you know, like that's. The market favorite, so we like to have that. It's one that's really heavy. It's great flavor. It loves cold weather. You know, you can pack you know 800 heads on a 50 foot bed. I mean, on a 100 foot bed. You know, so we try to have those like staple crops. We also do arugula, um, spinach. You know, we're actually working on some like some summer spinach right now, which we've been having some somewhat success on. Um, we grow, um, you know, like your usual summer things. I mean, crap load of tomatoes. Mostly cherries. We do some romas, some um, juliettes, which are like a smaller variety. Lots of peppers. You know, we love sweet peppers. A few hot ones, maybe some jalapenos, um, but mostly, you know, like a mixed bells. We find that people like to get like a, a bag of mixed bell pepper. There's something about a bag of just like different colors, different sizes that just appeal, just appeal to people. Um, Jimmy Nardello's is like a, a staple in terms of peppers, shishitos. You know, they come in early. You know, we take them all the way open times to Christmas. Yeah, so I think, you know, things like that, um, your standard eggplants. We do um, parsley year-round, cilantro as much as possible. Yeah, so, I mean, just quite a bit of greens. I mean, you know, and then herbs, you know, things like basil, another one, dill. Um, yeah. So quite a bit of greens. I mean, you know, we're known for our greens. Um, you know, I mean, root veggies, um, beets, you know, we do like a trio of beets, like, you know, mixed beets, um, golden beets, um, you know, red and the um, chiage beets. And of course, hackerai, that's another staple too. Very yep. cool. Very cool. Yeah, I miss uh, mirror and I miss growing those, man. I grew mirror Cherokee magenta. That was like my mix for a couple years. Year round, yeah. those grew great in the winter too. Um, yeah. And I'm growing... I'm growing Salanova now because I'm selling to restaurants and I'm like, that's kind of what they want. So, yeah, but Mir is, man, that lettuce is amazing. 
that's just yeah. like and and for us with with the salad nova i mean once we adapted um the green harvester and we started scaling up it was just you know the whole idea of you know planting the seed then transplant and having to do one by one and cut it's like i can just get you know the standard you know um, all-star mix or greenhouse mix i make eight walks down that row you know once they pop up i drop the mic um the um drip irrigation i walk past it say hi once a week and ready i just mow that thing down you know bubble spin bags and off the market yeah it's just a straightforward process yeah very cool um all right so vincent here is asking any equipment besides the hoop houses you think are worth buying new um rather than used and bootstrapped yeah i would say um if possible if you can afford like a professional salad mixer you know you spend spend the 15 1600 bucks that it's going to take versus getting maybe you know the di1 you know that you make from like a you know like a um, washing machine you know, a, a washing machine a greens harvester um i think that's one definitely buy that new um yeah, I mean, I think things that, that you can buy used, I would say like shake cloth. If you can buy shake cloth used, that's a good thing. Um, and I'm not totally against not buying a hoop house used. It's just, again, going back to your capacity, where you are in your journey. If it makes sense then in terms of like, you know, maybe your budget, you know, I mean, go right ahead. For us, it's like we didn't want to incur any debt and we didn't want to, you know, like borrow money to go buy, you know, a bunch of houses and then have to like focus on trying to make money to then pay them off. You know, but now that, you know, we have a good revenue stream, yeah, we can go ahead and leverage and then maybe, you know, borrow 20 grand and go build, you know, that awesome, you know, you know, quarter acre house, you know, that's 200 feet by 40 feet wide, but we're not dependent on the crops coming out of it to pay for it, you know, because we already have the existing cash flow. So I think you can bootstrap to a point, but then use your existing cash flow to leverage to then buy that new equipment that's gonna make life so much easier going down the road. Yeah, I think a lot of stuff's hard to find used right now probably too, just because oh, yeah. there's so many farms opening right now. It's hard to find new stuff. I mean, sometimes stuff's just out of stock. Yeah, yeah. Uh, so um, whatever you have, yep. Yeah, I also think that, you know, the kind of farming that you do or I do, like there really isn't that much equipment. Like that's the kind of the beauty of it. I mean, you were talking houses, irrigation, wash yeah. station like are you, are you still using your bcs or did you, do you are you is that gone <laughs> um i use it let's see go out um i use it when we were prepping another property that's it right uh, yeah i loaned it out for a month um sometime back in may june <laughs> um didn't miss it it's back um when we were doing over the homestead you know back in june i used it um and so if I'm breaking new ground, I use it. But really, it's just kind of sitting around. It's looking pretty. Um, yeah. So maybe something like that. Absolutely. I mean, I, I use BCS. If, if, if you can find one, yes, jump on it. You know, those things, I mean, they last. Um, yeah, my buddy Kenny, um, when, when I first started out, I was actually borrowing his. And his dad bought his like back in like the 70s. You know, it's like a smaller one. You know, um, and you know, I mean, that thing, I mean, like helped us. So, yeah, if you can find one like that, yeah, buy that. But, yeah. Yeah. Cool. Yeah, I have. Uh, I The only time I've ever used a BCS was to prep new ground. Actually, the first time I ever touched a BCS was like building this farm. That was like the only time I've ever. Um, yeah. And that was recently. But I just borrowed uh, Brendan Cordell's from uh, Weaver Acres. He just let me his. I, I got to go. We're start, we're going to put a third tunnel in. That's like the only I got it. That's the only time I'm going to use it. And then so, yeah, yeah. Fi find a buddy like, you know, barter with him for to let it borrow for a little bit. And also, too, I think that's one of the beautiful things about like if you can if you're in a, an area where you guys are farming collectively is like share implements, you know, um, like right now I'm thinking about getting the PDR for the BCS. Just because we're at a scale right now where it's like, let's make flipping beds a lot easier, you know, and the PDR, you know, does exactly, you know, what my landscape break does, you know, set it at a half an inch, you know, you can sprinkle, you know, your amendments on top, you know, a hair bit of compost, whatever, run that down the bed, you know, it's not going to compact the bed. 
And it just saves you from doing all, you know, the back and forth raking. So I can see us going forward using the BCS along with the PDR um, as just a way of making things a lot easier in terms of just manual labor. You know, yeah. Yeah, and as you scale up, it makes uh, complete sense. Yep, yeah. Okay. Um, do you have any problems with deer? Uh, <laughs> yes and no. I mean, I would say for the past years, no. But I was letting one of my fields go, um, just go awry for a while as the soil is kind of built up. And the grass got so high where the only time you can see the deer is when they pop their heads up. And so they didn't really know the boundaries between the fence and so they came in and found my tomatoes and so they came in like two nights back to back and so i just like cut the field and i haven't seen them since but really no deer pressure yeah do you think the tunnels also help with that the tunnels help well a deer will come in in a tunnel maybe at the end and then it's something about that closed space that kind of freaks them out and you know and the more the tunnels crowded i mean they're definitely not going to walk through but i would say if you're going to get a tunnel invest in the fence yeah, fence it around. I mean, I've been having that discussion with uh, one of my mentees lately. Like, well, you, sp you just spent two grand and, you know, plus all this other stuff, like three grand. Let's just focus on maybe spending another 500 and getting the fence around this thing. And just peace of mind, because you hate to do all this work, put all your plants in, and then it just takes one night for one deer to walk through, man. Ten, twenty thousand dollars $20,000, just like... Gone, yeah. Yeah, it's crazy. All right, cool. Take a couple more questions if you guys have questions. I know we've been chatting for a while here. Um, all right, here's another question from Farmer Nurse. Uh, farming's 24-7, 365. How do you plan a vacation? Have you ever felt burnt out? <laughs> and if so, how do you recharge? Yes, so vacation. Actually, we're going on a vacation next week, and we're taking the whole week off, and we're going to just do like our vacation road trip, and we have like two spots that we're going to go. That's going to go from like Monday through Thursday. And the rest of the weekend is kind of going to be like whatever comes to mind along the way. And again, that's one of the beautiful thing about having the family together, that the farm will continue to run as usual. We're debating whether we want to send someone to market or just say, you know what, you guys just do your normal thing. And we're just going to go on the road and just blast out for a whole week, come back. And we're actually going to do that again um, around the middle of August. So we, we've been trying to do that every 90 days, you know, throughout the year, and especially in the summertime when you kind of hit that summer wall. And so, you know, right around July, I think it's important for farms. I mean, farmers just take a week off and just, you know, just do something crazy. Just get away far from the farm. Um, yeah. So that's what we're going to do next week. Yeah. Yeah. The yeah. summer burnout is real, man. Yeah, it's real. But also, too, I think... In the midst of this, I think we have to take time out. So, like, for me, every month I get a massage. So, like, tomorrow, you know, I'm leaving the farm at, like, 1130. And for the rest of the day, you know, I'm going to get a massage. And then I have, like, a, a speaking gig in the afternoon. But for the rest of the day, I'm just relaxing. I'm not going to lift nothing heavier than a plate, you know, after 12, you know. And I think that's important that we take some time out within the year so I've just scheduled that. Like every time I get a massage, I schedule my next massage before I leave. So at least once a month, I'm gonna have this a farmer day just for me. You know, I'm gonna do some random stuff. I'm just like flip flopping it. You know, shorts, and you know, like yeah. <laughs> and then you know, of course, we have you know like the hard breaks, like every ninety days, take a week off. But also too throughout the week, where Mondays are are days where. I really don't farm on a Monday. It's kind of my day to probably go help someone else, you know, probably, you know, fulfill their dreams, kind of do nothing, run errands, you know, um, run around, do anything or nothing, lay around, you know, um, yeah, you know, just do whatever. Um, Sundays are kind of days like that, too, where it's like I'm not really farming, you know, I'm, you know, kind of church activities, family, kind of hanging out. I may go to the farm, kind of look around, eat a tomato, you know, grab a cucumber, you know, look at a neighbor and then, you know, go back home. <laughs> so I've really kind of had it to where my weeks are, say, Tuesday through Friday. And it kind of like builds up from Tuesday. Friday is like the market prep day. Saturday is really a market. I'm just hanging out with the community, 
you know, I got a latte, you know, I got me a Vietnamese coffee underneath, a coconut water. I'm shooting breeze with the people. I'm collecting money. Like, that's not work. You know what I'm saying? So, and after that, I'm coming home, you know, back to the farm. I may water the seedlings, make sure that the farm didn't get blown away or be eaten by deers. And after that, Saturday afternoon, you know, maybe date night, family afternoon, whatever comes to mind with, with the family. So I think we've gotten it now to where the farm is really working for us. And, you know, and even Fridays is like a, all hands on board. You know, my kids are involved, you know, we're bagging stuff. So, you know, and the crew has done most of the work on Thursday or Friday morning. So we're just kind of polishing up on Friday, getting things clean. We're done. You know, uh, we may have takeout or we may, you know, my wife, since she's home, she probably already cooked for Thursday. So, I mean, we try now to get our breaks, man. I'm like, yesterday was like a rainy day. And it's like, I think I want to have a steak today and just kind of lay around and sort seeds. And I haven't seen Netflix in like a month. So I'm going to watch, you know, vacation rentals because I'm going on vacation next week. Kind of prime me. <laughs> nice, nice. Yeah, so that was my day yesterday. So, yeah, man, just find that time and take time out. Yeah. Yeah, I think part of having systems on your farm, which you've put a lot of thought into and in getting your farm running well. So you put the thought up front. It's the same thing with your thoughts and finding a system to take time off and work that into the whole system. All right, cool. Uh, I got one more question here. Uh, this is... I guess kind of a follow-up question. We, you, you hit it on. You talked a little bit about vermicompost before uh, that you're going to be planning on using it, but maybe you could expand on it. Uh, the question here is thoughts upon vermicompost and its ability to create an immune system in your plants to fight off pests. Um, but like, what's maybe you can answer that, or maybe like, what are some of the ideas behind choosing the system that you chose with vermicompost? So with vermicompost, well, I used to do vermicompost on on my homestead, and I noticed just how the food just tastes better. The soil was better. I had so many, you know, composted worms in my system. And with the no-till system, there's so much left behind organic matter in the soil. So you literally have to feed the soil now because, you know, the worms, they just continue to multiply. So as long as you're feeding the soil, you know, the ecosystem on a whole is being fed. You know, you're constantly adding wood chips to the walkways. Um, you know, the local mycelium, you know, has, you know, a constant supply of things to break down. Now we have an increased amount of like moles and voles, which I mean, only over winter, you know, they may, you know, pull out a few carrots and a few, you know, you know, beets you may see, you know, go underground, you know, with, with, with I mean, with, which like will leave the leaves on top. But overall, I think the vermicompost system to me is just starting out, I mean, and doing what nature has always done, which is to use, you know, the critters that are there to till the system. And as they do so, they add fertility. Um, you're not disturbing the ecosystem, you know, so when you talk about like the mycorrhiza, you know, system within the soil, um, everything is intact. And so we're just focusing on feeding the soil and the soil should get better year after year, you know, with, you know, wood chips and just all the different things um, with the rabbits, you know, drop-ins, you know, those are like little micro, um, you know, domes, you know, where now, you know, you have things for bacteria, fungi to attack. Um, so it's, it's, it's just a win-win. I've seen more snakes this, this year than ever. So the snakes are looking fat, you know, they're eating a lot of voles and moles, you know, the worms. It's even funny to watch the worms because you'll like disturb something and you'll see a worm like poke its head up because it thinks that you're um, a mole. And if you like, you know, like tap the soil next to them, they'll actually like bounce out the soil and just lay on top of the soil and kind of like stay still, you know, because, you know, the, the voles um, can sense their vibration so they'll come out of the soil, lay on top of the soil, and kind of lay still and play, you know, possum, and wait for the vibration to go by. So it's kind of funny to watch them, you know. So it's just awesome. I mean, just being in observance of the soil system and see what it's doing, and just being a steward to that system. And the plants are really a byproduct of the system, you know. So for example, this year, you know, I'm looking at um, my tomatoes. And I'm looking at the Sakura varieties and do these tomatoes are just like, I mean, big. And we're planting them at 12 inch spacing. So we have a hundred beds, I mean, a hundred plants on a bed, but each plant, I mean, will give us, I mean, at least five pounds on, I mean, easily, you know, so, I mean, you know, so it's just, 
I mean, the yields are just amazing. I mean, we're growing char that's like three feet tall. You know, I mean, you know, the stems are, you know, like 18 inches, you know, the leaves are not eight, I mean, 18 inches. Even with our long bins, we still have to trim them down just to fit in the giant bins. You know, so it's, it's just all good problems, you know. I mean, hundreds of pounds of cucumbers per week. So I think um, growing, um, you know, with, you know, worms and a system that's, I would say, mimicking nature by design is just a win-win overall. And I think it's only going to get better. Yeah, I think all these systems, the longer you keep them going, you keep plants active, growing, the better yeah. they get. I had a chef out um, at my farm and he was helping me pull some carrots and he's like looking at the soil and he's like, I can't believe how many bugs are in the soil. Like, you know, th most people aren't used to seeing that. Right. Yeah. I mean, you know, like we have some, so many roly polies. I mean, I have a, a video that I'll probably post where just cutting the head of lettuce and pulling back and literally seeing like 20 roly and like the biggest ones you've ever seen and like shiny and healthy and they're at the base of that plant because they have natural cover in there you know there are a few worms in there i mean the worms are actually in the heads of the lettuce they're coming up you know the red wrigglers and they're doing their thing you know you know they're eating you know all of that you know i mean decomposed leaves they're at the base and so he just cuts your heads high and i mean so everyone's doing their job and so for us it's just monitoring the system and being stewards that's awesome, man. All right. I think we got through most of the questions here, Howard. Uh, I know we've been chatting for a while. Is there anything else you just uh, want to hit on or talk about that we didn't get a chance to? I would say probably one of the things is about like the future education of farmers um, and, you know, growing a new generation of farmers. I think that's is a pivotal thing, I think, going forward. I think looking at our university systems in terms of big ag schools, you know, whether it's the, you know, the Rutgers, um, you know, all, all the other, you know, um, institutions, um, you know, the ANTs of the world here in North Carolina, I think they don't go far enough. And I think they're lagging way behind, you know, in certain aspects, especially when it comes to small scale farming. And I think, you know, a lot of the farmers, you know, like uh, John Marchier, um, you know, Curtis Stones, all the different guys who have made courses, you know, never sing, um, you know, Clay Bottom, you know, I mean, all the great farmers who have, made, who have made courses, I still think we need, I mean, a lot more of that. But I think we also have to bridge the gap between farmers who are making these courses and are putting out, you know, tremendous amount of information. Jesse, who's just put out a great book, you know, on soil. How do we bridge the gap between you know, the educational system and you know see the value in what we're doing on a small scale and to adapt these principles you know and to be able to crank out a new system of farmers and i think it's going to take a collective effort you know between us as farmers who are in the educational space and the big institutions to create some type of partnerships you know but simultaneously also to i think doing our own thing wherever we find the space to educate a new wave of people, you know, maybe in our own community, you know, maybe having, you know, the people who are working with us to help them to go set up their farms, you know, versus to have them kind of work for us for a while, you know, as an intern or as a farmhand, and then they kind of go out there and kind of go through the school of hard knocks like us. How do we help other farmers start new farms? And so that's where I'm at today is creating capacity. It's like no one, you know, needs to go through what I've gone through, especially if you're close by me. It's like, here's a blueprint of what I've done. Here is a new way of thinking about farm and farm systems. You know, here's the market for the taking, and I'll hold your hand from starting LLC all the way, you know, to, you know, going into a local retailer. And I think we just need more of that. Um, and, you know, it's going to take, I think, a lot of effort, a lot of sacrifice on the current farmers. You know, how do we partner, you know, current guys who are enthusiastic about farming but may not have the land? You know, how do we, you know, bridge the resource gap, you know, with the farmers who are retiring, but, you know, they're probably going to sell the land off or if their kids inherit it, their kids are not going to farm. And it's, you know, like a big paycheck to their kids. So I think the next wave of farmers, farmers are going to be key um, in terms of education, but fast paced education because innovation is going like this. Um, you know, information, technology is going like this, but our educational system and our capacity to learn is still on a plateau. So we have to be able to increase that, you know, and we don't have to go through a two year community college degree to get a degree and then go out here and kind of find our way. 
or four year degree, a master's degree or whatever it is, and you still can grow anything, but you're more prepped to, you know, get a big ad job. So we need to grow a whole new generation of small scale farmers who are stewards of the land and not people who are just cranking out food. Agree 100%, Howard. I think that, you know, people like yourself and, you know, me and other people in the community who are trying to do that, I think is going to be crucial to get yeah. that ball rolling. And small scale farming has changed so much in the past 10, 15 years. But I also think that the traditional route of more formalized education isn't for everybody and wow. is it may be just a different path. And so right now is there's no better time. If you want to get into this, I mean, there's so much information out there. Like you can learn how to farm with a couple of books and the internet and talking to some people locally. Yeah, that's true. But I think, again, it takes, I think, a little bit more than that also too. I think there's some people who are adept to do that, like myself and you, but there are others who are going to need their hands held. Sure. I think, you know, we can bring people in and also people who are not even thinking about farming who will make great farmers, you know, so how do we create a space or spaces, I think, you know, across this country where people can see themselves in different farming capacities and also too, it's not just about farming, but, you know, you have the value chain of farms, you know, from the seed grower all the way down, you know, to the farmer, you know, to the wholesaler, restaurants and so forth. But then the ecosystem around that, you know, you know, and all of that is being dominated by big farms. So there's so many opportunities around that for people. So you may not be necessarily a farmer, but you may be in the logistics of getting food from point A to point B. You know, you may be in, you know, brand and marketing, you know, social media management, you know, all the things that are on the frontier. Um, you know, there's going to be a whole revolution in terms of uh, manufacturing and local manufacturing and tool making, 3D printing. You know, how do we see ourselves in that ecosystem that supports an, um, agriculture and also to the new wave of, you know, farm tools that we haven't even imagined, you know, robotics, you know, how these things play in, you know, where, you know, let's have a BCS that now, you know, you just take off the handles, you know, and put, you know, maybe, you know, a three pound, you know, um, systems on there that's, you know, self-learning. And now I can go down and broad fork the whole bed, you know, by having some sensors inside of your house, you know. So now you just, you know, I'll fit your house with sensors and now the BCS does it by itself, you know, compost and all those things, you know. Now maybe someone can design a, a new tray that's similar to the wind strip where now a, a robot can come down now and plant all those things, you know, four inches apart, six inches apart, you know. Yeah. So to me, I think we're at the dawn of a new age where where we were i think 100 years ago you know coming into the industrial age and ag i think that's where we are today um you know i would say 100 years ago we were you know you know model t you know horse and buggy you know guys were having a fit you know that you know you know you know they're taking our jobs i think today we're in that same stage where you know machine learning you know and working along with a robot next to you is going to be you know the future of agriculture, you know, so maybe versus a farmhand, you know, maybe, you know, it's a semi -auton you know, um, autonomous bot that's working with you, that's learning, you know, and improving your SOPs way faster than you can even think. Yeah, I think I, I agree. I also want to say that it's important to look at things outside of your circle for ideas. So if it's if you think big ag is the enemy, but you know what, they are very efficient at getting things done. So there might be things like you said, like planting or you know, yeah. and harvesting and stuff like that, that can be scaled down for sure. But I think that it's also super important. What we've been talking about a lot tonight was getting people involved in agriculture, maybe that they didn't even know that was a thing. And I know that you do a great job of that. And I want to give a little shout out to Kamal as well, because I know oh, he, yeah. he brings so many people to the farm and they, they've never even touched a shovel or, you know, things right. like that. Right. You know, beekeeping flowers, you know, I mean, I have a friend, you know, who she does flowers. And I'm like, you know, maybe you know another way besides just growing flowers for wholesale and retail is to now do workshops on how to make bouquets and arrangements and, you know, all the different things around, you know, that particular part of the farm business. You know, some, you know, for example, a big part I see where we only have two major seedling suppliers in this whole region. You know, Banner Greenhouse way out in you know, West North Carolina 
and Aaron's Creek in Southern Virginia. I mean, we can use 10 more small versions of those around here. So again, how do we find the person who says, you know, I don't like farming and the bugs, but a greenhouse, a nice climate control space, you know, where they know, you know, with, you know, a vacuum seeder and everything is right here for me, you know, and you can see the numbers. Again, those systems are what we need. So I think if we start to educate people and focus on the bigger picture where we're problem solving and finding the solutions for the local market, then we can create jobs and opportunities for others. And then coming together, we can then leverage, you know, our resources to then create these things that we need. So it's like, why go all the way to, you know, to Western North Carolina, where we can have a mini banner right here serving the triangle. Yeah, I think the other big one is compost making. <laughs> I know that's like the obvious one, but if we got more compost makers, um, and I, I say this often, you think about like the gold rush, the people that made money in the gold rush were the people selling the shovels. <laughs> so not, yeah not the people doing the gold rushing so like you can make i say to people all the time you want to make a lot of money in farm make compost yeah compost yeah is another one i mean you know you know one man's trash another man's you know gold so yeah i know i know like a lot of compost companies they they the people dumping off stuff have to pay them to take the the stuff like that's to me i'm just like what <laughs> so there's there's a lot of opportunity there yeah, there's a lot of opportunity because, again, I think because a lot of us, we're not thinking cooperatively and we're still in this minority mindset. And we have to get into this a win-win. We have to look at things from a win-win state and say, okay, here is the starting point. How do we get to a win-win? And I think once we start with win-win, then the solution oftentimes will be win-win. You know, it may be a little bit more complicated. It may be a little bit longer. It may take more minds in the room. But if that's the outcome, that it has to be a win-win, we can find it. Because once we find it, that's it. You know? Absolutely, Howard. All right. Anything else you want to add before we try to wrap it up? Um, that's it, man. You know, um, you know, that's pretty much it. All I want to cover for today. Yep. Win-win. Oh, yeah. Stay positive and work towards a win-win. That's it. All right, Howard. I really appreciate you taking the time tonight and uh always love uh chatting with you and and following you with what you're doing. Hey, man, anytime, man. I mean, you know, thank you for having me on, man. And, you know, you know, to share, you know, what we do here and we hope to continue to get better and to share better information in, in the future. So thanks right. a lot. Thanks, Howard. All right. So huge thanks to Howard. Uh, obviously, we got pretty deep into a lot of things there, which is awesome. I usually have those kinds of conversations with Howard. Uh, I've done a lot of videos with Howard. They were a little a little while ago, but I actually put links down below in the video description. So I did more of a tour video uh, and then some also some nerdy detail videos that I did on the No-Till Growers channel. So those are linked down below. And please go follow Howard on Instagram and uh, all those things. So thank you so much, guys. I uh, really appreciated the evening tonight and for all the nice questions and comments. So we'll see you guys soon.